Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I know that uh, people are just logging in to the webinar today. So I'm going to give everybody just a couple more minutes here and uh, we'll get started in a few seconds here. Thanks. Okay, so I know people are still going to be walking into the uh, or virtual walking into our webinar today, but I wanted to welcome everyone. Thank you for joining uh, the Home Builders Association's Haven uh, first ever webinar, Navigating the Human Resources Side of Building During COVID-19. I know that a lot of you are working remotely and are just adjusting and trying to get through this crisis. So we're, we're here to help you. Uh, my name is Wendy McNeil and I'm the VP of Marketing and Education with Haven and I will be the host moderator for today's webinar. Hopefully everybody can see the screen and can hear everything okay. If not, please use uh, the chat and the Q&A, but I'll go through that in one moment here. Today's agenda, uh, we'll be going through the guidelines on using uh, or participating in this webinar. We'll go through some Haven resources that are currently available to you uh, during this crisis here. Uh, we'll talk about our speakers and they'll get started on to their content. And then near the end of the session, we'll do about a 10 minute Q&A. So we do encourage you to ask questions during the session. We'll do our best to get to them, but uh, just to ensure that our speakers have enough time to get through their content. We might reserve some of them for after the session, but I do encourage you to keep your questions flowing and um, you will notice that uh, you will likely be in a view only mode which is fine and so that's why I'm saying please use your Q&A uh, there's a task bar that you should see that popped up on your webinar that you can enable chat or you can use a Q&A so either option is available to you um, I will be asking the questions as, as I can with the speakers but I said just make sure that we get through the content together on this and uh, the speaker's emails, uh, if you're not able to get your question answered during this session, uh, we will begin sharing the emails of the speakers and they'll be happy to answer questions offline for you as well. And those of you who are not able to, uh, weren't able to attend, or those uh, of you who want to share this content with perhaps your colleagues or other people you know, uh, we will be posting a recording of this webinar on our, um, on our two resources that we have available for you. Sorry, one is our eLearn, eLearn.haven.ca. As you can see here, this is our web page address, and uh, we'll be posting it just up here for you guys to access quickly. Uh, again, it will be at no charge to ensure that you get the resources that you need. And uh, a little plug here, if you are requiring uh, builders to earn CPDs during this time, uh, I know it's stressful for you, but we do have an option on eLearn, and you can uh, everything is 40% off to ensure that you get time and in respect for your um, pan, you know, this pandemic, but make sure that you can get that accessed at a convenient price. And uh, also, we also have a haven.ca COVID-19 resources page. If you've not been to our website yet, I do encourage you to check it out uh, on the main navigation bar here. You can see the link. And from here, we have posted federal, provincial, municipal, uh, we have business um, information that we're updating constantly every day. So we do encourage you, if you have not checked it out or haven't checked out in a few days, do come back and take a look at it. Uh, we're, we're increased or adding resources each time uh, we get some new updates. If you see, oh, sorry. Um, sorry if my uh, volume is kind of quiet here. So if you uh, have any additional resources you wish to share with us, please send me an email, wendy at haven.ca, and we'd be happy to uh, post that onto our website as well. And just to get a quick idea on um, how, you know, who, who's on our webinar today, we're going to be um, just doing a quick poll here. Oh, sorry. Give me one sec here, guys. Oh, no, sorry, we won't be doing the poll this time. Uh, we're doing it at the end of the session. My apologies for that. That's my error. 
And uh, so what we're going to do is, uh, what we want to do is jump right into the context. I know we have a lot to share today. So our two speakers today are Andrew Delmonico. He's a partner with Kuhn LLP, also a director with Haven, and uh, sort of the Haven Board of Directors. His email address, as you see on the screen here, is adelmonico at kuhnco.net, and the website is kuhnco.net. And we also have Michael Scott, the Vice President of the Building Division at Impact Recruitment, Michael at impactrecruitment.ca, and their website is impactrecruitment.ca. So uh, we're really lucky that these uh, Haven members have um, come up to the uh, come up to us and said that they'd be happy to help and share their information with all our members and other guests who are listening in today. So what we're going to do is jump right into it. So Andrew, if you wanted to take the lead. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Wendy and everyone. Thank you very much for uh, attending today. So essentially, I'm going to be reviewing some of the legal implications uh, that are arising and are changing uh, somewhat rapidly with respect to this COVID-19 uh, pandemic issue. Um, essentially, I'll be talking briefly about uh, some changes to the Employment Standards Act and uh, general uh, employment rules that apply uh, during this time. And then I will be moving on to speak briefly about some issues arising with workers' compensation and then human rights. So you can follow along with the slides, which you should all uh, be able to see. Okay, so starting off with respect to some changes to the Employment Standards Act. So there are some changes that have come through, some of which are uh, temporary and some of which are permanent that are gonna be sticking around after that have arisen due to, to this issue. So there's changes that are effective as of March 23rd, um, the Employment Standards Act, which permits unpaid leave uh, for not only employees that are diagnosed with COVID-19, but also for uh, a number of other situations, uh, employees who are, are having an effect uh, due to the pandemic or due to the virus. So as you can see there, if an employee is diagnosed with COVID-19 or if they're under quarantine or self-isolation, if they're directed not to come to work by their employer, if they're providing care to an eligible person, and you can see such as a child or disabled relative, or if they're trapped outside of the province due to travel restrictions, they are permitted to job protected unpaid leave for as long as those circumstances exist. Effectively, uh, what this means is that the employee, it's an unpaid leave, but the employee is entitled to be off work and they're entitled to return uh, to their same position, their same job uh, when the circumstances no longer exist. Now, you as the employer, and I'm sure a number of the people that are listening today are business owners, um, you may request reasonably sufficient proof that these circumstances exist. So that what that is is going to depend um, from circumstance to circumstance. But what you cannot do is request a doctor's note. So this is something that's different than perhaps you're accustomed to for extended leave uh, for employees for medical reasons. Uh, you're not entitled to request a, a doctor's note with respect to this issue. So these changes are not going to be around um, forever. They are specific to the pandemic and they will be removed from the Employment Standards Act when they are no longer needed. Now, as I mentioned, these came into effect on March 23rd, 2020, uh, but they apply retroactively to January 27th, 2020. So practically what that means for you as the employer is that if an employee is terminated, uh, if, you, if you've faced a situation where an employee has presented with COVID-19 related issues or one of the other circumstances that's protect, uh, protected between January 27th, 2020 and March 23rd, you are required, uh, if you've terminated that employee's employment, to re-offer the employee uh, employment on the same uh, or comparable terms as when they were terminated. So I don't know um, how significant of an issue that is going to be, but it's something to keep in mind that obviously employers are having to make real-time decisions uh, sometime with not 
uh, all the information or information that's changing rapidly. And so if, if you've made a decision to terminate uh, an employee for these reasons, um, you are obligated by these new changes to the Employment Standards Act to re-offer uh, re-employment to them. So as I had mentioned earlier, um, some of these changes, the COVID specific changes are, are, are going to be time restrained. Hopefully they, they won't be around that long because they're going to be uh, repealed when this issue is, is dealt with, hopefully sooner than later. There is one change that is going to be permanent that's come into the Employment Standards Act as a result of this pandemic issue, uh, but which will remain uh, afterwards. Now this is a new right for employees to receive up to three days of unpaid leave for personal illness after they have uh, had 90 consecutive days of employment. So this is not obviously equivalent to requiring paid sick time, which is not provided for in the Employment Standards Act, but it does provide a right for job protected unpaid leave due to personal illness. So again, the employer uh, may request proof there's no specific provision that says that a doctor's note can't be asked for with respect to these uh, general illness or injury leave. And the employee is obligated to provide proof of the condition as soon as practical. And so, as I mentioned, this section will continue to apply permanently, uh, notwithstanding uh, the end to, to the pandemic issue. So one of the most significant issues that we've been um, sort of advising our clients on as, as this uh, coronavirus pandemic has unfolded is, what do I do with my existing workforce? I may have a number of projects on the go. Not all of them are gonna continue, uh, at least for the foreseeable future. You know, contracts, one, one circumstance we've seen a lot of, which you may have, have been affected by, is, is um, contracts are being ended for force majeure. And so work that you thought you had lined up, you don't have lined up. So the question is, what do you do, uh, at least in the short term, with your employees? So generally speaking, there is no right under the Employment Standards Act to lay off employees, uh, regardless of the content of an employment agreement. So the first place you're gonna look to see whether or not you have a right to lay off an employee is going to be uh, in your employment contract with that employee. If you do have um, a right to uh, lay off an employee, the Employment Standards Act is going to set some parameters around how long that layoff can be before it's deemed to be a termination. So under the Employment Standards Act, you can lay off an employee a te for a temporary layoff for a period of up to 13 weeks in any period of 20 consecutive weeks. Okay, if it goes longer than that, it's going to be deemed to be a termination. So again, this pra the parameters set by the Employment Standards Act don't give you a right to lay off an employee that you don't otherwise have in your employment agreement. So the most important place to look is in that employment agreement. Now, if you don't have a written employment agreement with your employees, or if your written employment agreement doesn't deal with this situation, it's possible uh, that there may be an implied term um, based on sort of an industry-wide practice that, there, that a layoff would be permissible for uh, a temporary period of time. However, what is being looked at there is not the kind of events that we're dealing with now typically it's not dependent on these sort of um, unforeseeable events that are affecting the industry as a whole it really is an industry specific requirement to look at the industry and to say are layoffs um, routinely provided for that's probably not going to be uh, the strongest argument that you can make and so if you don't have uh, a written employment agreement providing for layoffs then you're going to be trying to fall likely within uh, number three there, which is with the consent of the employee. So essentially in this situation, you would have to approach your employee and say that for economic or business reasons, you have to do a temporary layoff and you are seeking the employee's uh, agreement to do that. Now, if this is something that you choose to do, you're obviously gonna wanna document that in writing. You're gonna wanna look at your employment agreement if you have it and um, make sure that you're complying with any requirements for amendments to that agreement. Uh, that may be set already. If you don't have an employment agreement or if you're, if you're acting outside of that, um, you're going to want to take steps to document uh, some of the key terms, for instance, how long um, the employee is going to be laid off for, 
uh, whether or not they're going to have a right uh, to come back at a specific date and, and whether there's going to be any other changes to their uh, employment contract uh, as a result. You also may want to confer with your uh, benefits expert to make sure that this is permissible under uh, your benefits uh, plan uh, because it's uh, possible that continuous employment may be a requirement of uh, continuing benefits for that particular employee. So what's your risk then if you don't have an employment agreement that permits a layoff and if you um, are not able to secure um, the consent of your employee to this, any layoff that you impose uh, may amount to a constructive dismissal of that employee, which essentially means a dismissal in law, even though that was not your intention. So arising from that, you're going to have to pay compensation in lieu of reasonable notice, compensation for loss of benefits, et cetera. So there is financial exposure to, to getting this wrong as the business owner. So that brings us to the next point, which is, well, what should you do? So start off by reviewing your employment agreement. If you don't have one, you should probably get one. So you're asking yourself, is there a contractual right of layoff? And if there is, then you proceed in accordance with that contract. You're also going to want to make some informed decisions if you're not able to uh, proceed to a temporary layoff about what your financial exposure is going to be if you move towards termination. And so there's obviously the severance obligations that are set by the Employment Standards Act up to a maximum of eight weeks. But beyond that, there's common law, uh, which fills in and provides additional, uh, in some cases, significantly additional notice that's required and additional financial costs, obviously, that go along with that. So there is an exemption to be aware of under the Employment Standards Act with respect to some employees that are employed by a construction company. So if you are terminating an employee where your principal business is construction, and that employee is employed at one of your construction sites, then it may be the case that at least under the Employment Standards Act, there is no legal obligation to pay severance. This provision is one that's usually interpreted against the employer if there's any doubt. So there is some risk in relying on it, but it's something to keep in mind if there is an employee that falls within that definition and you're looking at uh, terminating them, whether or not there's, there's any severance obligations under the Employment Standards Act. Of course, there's still maybe other obligations under your employment agreement that would be in addition. So if you don't have a contractual right uh, of layoff, then you're gonna wanna ask yourself whether there's any argument that this is a customary part of your industry. More likely, you're gonna be having a discussion and perhaps a frank or a difficult discussion with that employee and asking whether they will agree to a temporary layoff. And of course, you have to consider your new obligations under the Employment Standards Act if an employee requests unpaid leave, either due to personal injury or personal illness generally, or due to the COVID-19 specific leave. So moving on then to consider some of the implications under the Workers' Compensation Act uh, in relation to COVID-19. Employers have a duty, which many of you probably are aware about already if you're business owners, you have to ensure a safe workplace and the health and safety of all your workers. Now, obviously one of the things that's coming up and one of the directions that's coming out from the public health authority is that as much as possible, we should be asking our employees to work from home. It's important to keep in mind as the employer that you're still bound by the occupational health and safety requirements with respect to agreed work from home. So that in other words, these legal obligations don't end at the door to your uh, construction site or your factory or wherever you do your, your supplying or whatever. So one thing to be proactive in, in sort of contemplating a shift in your workforce outside of the typical place where they've been working is to develop a health and safety policy that addresses some of these issues and how your occupational health and safety obligations are going to be met for employees that are starting to work from home. So one of the things to consider is what is going to be the protocol for evacuating the home, safe workplace practices and reporting, emergency preparedness and ergonomic considerations, particularly if this goes on for a long period of time. So it's a bit maybe uncomfortable to address with the employees what they're doing in their own home to, to ensure their occupational health and safety, but it's something that you're uh, required to do and should be doing. 
So there's also some specific uh, directions that have been put out by WorkSafe uh, with respect to what you should be doing at your own places of employment to ensure that the health and safety of your employees is protected during this outbreak. So you should be increasing your cleaning and disinfecting practices, providing additional hand washing information in stations, asking sick employees to stay home, implementing social distancing policies. And you can see the rest on the slide there. I won't go through them beginning to end, but the point is, is that whatever you've been doing to date to maintain the health and safety of your uh, workplace is not going to be sufficient in light of what's happening with COVID-19. So you're going to have to take additional measures and to document yourself taking additional measures to make sure that you are complying with the requirements for occupational health and safety that apply to you as an employer. Andrew, uh, sorry yes. to interrupt. I have a yes. question from uh, one of the uh, audience members. Uh, it was when an employee self, when an employee self isolated due to illness and then disregards isolation protocols, uh, are they required to report them to an authority because they're not following BC public health order? And if so, to whom do they um, report them to? Well, I mean, I think there's there's a couple ways to deal with that. So, I mean, um, on the workers' compensation side of things, the employee themselves has obligations under the uh, Workers' Compensation Act with respect to their own health and safety and managing their own health and safety in the workplace. So, I mean, that's a uh, an issue that uh, you may have to address with uh, WCB, but I think more importantly, it's an issue that you address um, vis-a-vis your position as an, as an employer. So it becomes an employment issue. Uh, where if they're not following di direction with respect to your policies and procedures, it then becomes a grounds for uh, certainly discipline and potentially um, termination if they won't comply. Um, at the end of the day, uh, it's going to obviously depend on, on uh, sort of the individual circumstances, which way you would go. But I think as the employer, you have every right and in fact, a legal obligation to be ensuring that your employees um, are, are complying with these practices and policies which you're putting out. Great. And uh, I have one more question, if I can bring it up right now. Uh, there's a question that what if an employee does not agree to the temporary layoff, even though the employer may not have the means to continue employment due to financial hardship? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a very important uh, question and, and one that we're dealing a lot with. So, I mean, the reality is that, is that if you if you can't secure the agreement of the employee to a temporary layoff and you don't otherwise have a contractual right to, to lay off that employee, then you're looking at um, essentially terminating the employment. Now, I suppose you could simply say, well, we are imposing a layoff and 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 um, sort of whether you like it or not. But I mean, the, the clear risk of that is that the employee is, is going to treat that as a constructive dismissal, meaning a dismissal in law, even if that's not what you intended. And they, they are likely gonna have every reason to treat um, that change to their employment in that manner. So short of them agreeing or you having some contractual right to do that, I mean, you're, you're looking at things evidence to that employee and what are your obligations, uh, whether it be under the employment contract, under the Employment Standards Act, or under the common law. Um, that's, that's really, um, your, your, that's the next step. And even though as the employer, you're saying it's regrettable and you don't want to escalate it um, in that manner, uh, your risk in, in sort of imposing a layoff unilaterally is that the employee is going to treat it that way anyways. Great, thanks. Okay, so there is a right, um, which again, many of you may know about, to refuse unsafe work. This is under the uh, regulations to the Workers' Compensation Act. An employer cannot require an employee to carry out work if there is reasonable cause, and you can see that the italicized words are meant to emphasize the importance. Uh, of them, but essentially if the, uh, there's reasonable cause to believe that it would cause undue hazard to the health and safety of any person. So this is something we've been dealing with as well, where employees who are aware of this are saying that they, they are not going to be attending at the workplace and they are not going to be attending um, with, uh, on site um, for this reason. And so the question then becomes, is there a reasonable cause for them to think there's an undue hazard in them doing so? And, and I mean, obviously, given that that things are so new, there's not a determination on any given circumstance that can really provide us guidance on that. But I think if you are complying with the requirements 
and you've documented that you're complying with the requirements of uh, the Workers' Compensation Act and the directives that are being put out by WCB, and you're complying with the uh, construction site-specific obligations uh, that are being put out by public health authorities, then that gives you a really good uh, basis to say that there actually is no reasonable cause to think there, there's undue hazard because you're following the guidelines. Um, keeping in mind, of course, that construction sites are deemed, uh, as well as other related industries, to be essential services. And so um, you're, you're supposed to be open, you're permitted to stay open, and there's some guidelines around um, what you should be doing on site. And if you're doing those things, then I think you have a really good reason to say that there actually is not uh, a reasonable cause to think that uh, an employee is, is unsafe in attending at your job site. One thing to keep in mind, or uh, one or two things to keep in mind as you're sort of evaluating the situation on a case-by-case -case basis is that um, an employer is not supposed to take discriminatory action against an employee for refusing to perform unsafe work. So if there actually is um, objective uh, reasons to think that there is reasonable cause, that there's some undue hazard, um, you as the employer are not uh, entitled to lay off or terminate or take other um, steps uh, to, to sort of discipline the employee for refusing to perform work that genuinely is unsafe. And one factor you have to consider when you're determining if it's genuinely unsafe is unsafe is that susceptible susceptible workers that have underlying conditions um, that has to be considered in determining whether or not they have reasonable cause not to attend work. And so, if you have an employee that's expressed to you that they have a serious respiratory condition, for instance, you're going to have to factor that into your decision as to whether or not there really is undue hazard uh, in light of all the precautions that you're taking. So as I said, there's some specific uh, directives being put out with respect to construction sites. You can see them there, um, no more than 50 people together in the same space. You're supposed to be increasing your hand washing stations on site, identifying where they are, practicing social distancing, and you can see there's a number of other things there. So again, I think the takeaway is that, that times have changed as a result of this COVID-19 and what you've been doing to maintain uh, the health and safety of your employees previously may not be enough. Uh, in light of what your current obligations are. So finally, um, just briefly with respect to human rights, as many of you probably know, um, there's legislation that prevents employers from discriminating in employment on the basis of grounds, uh, including age, race, national or ethnic origin, physical and mental disability. So there's a couple of these that actually might apply uh, in the present circumstances. It's not quite clear that COVID-19 is classified as a disability, but um, I think there's good reason to think that the human rights tribunals will treat it as such. I understand that in Ontario, at least, uh, SARS was similarly treated as a disability previously. And so um, I think there's, there's good reason to make an educated guess that this is going to, to constitute the same. So assuming that's the case, you have a duty as an employer to accommodate that employee to the point of undue hardship. So undue hardship is going to depend on the circumstances, but it's not just going to be that it costs you more or is more difficult as an employer. So if an employee is off due to a COVID-19 related illness and comes back and they're still not able to perform their functions at the same uh, capacity or rate that they were otherwise able to, that's something you're going to have to factor into in accommodating their day-to-day um, -day scope. And then finally, um, obviously, as an employer, you can't discriminate on the place of origin, race, or ethnicity. So, for instance, um, there's obviously some places that are associated with the outbreak of the pandemic. So if you have employees that are affiliated with any of those places, you cannot discriminate uh, against them on that basis. So just uh, some, in summary, um, some final thoughts. Stay up to date. Um, the requirements are changing very, very rapidly, uh, almost from day to day. And the good thing about that is that the information is widely available. So it's good to check uh, daily to the updates from the government and see if there's anything that changes um, sort of what we've discussed today. Obviously, follow your public health advice. Be mindful that your responsibilities may extend beyond the workplace. Communicate with your employees uh, about your expectations. Um, the issue of uh, available assistance, I know Michael's going to be speaking on in just a few moments here. And obviously, seek legal advice for specific situations. Um, this is sort of general advice about some of the changes in, in the law, but there's a lot to it when it comes to assessing um, an individual situation. So subject to any further questions or comments now, I would hand things over to Michael. 
Um, I'm going to do, sorry, I'm going to interrupt before we head on. I have uh, one or two questions, but I'm just going to do one question right now, and then we'll save the rest so we get through Michael's presentation as well. Um, when, an when an employee leaves work to self-isolate because they are sick and then go to the grocery store, et cetera, that is, a, that is a direct violation of the BC public health order. How do you deal with that? How do we report them to an BC authority? Um, and and uh yeah, so that would be the first question I would ask here, and then we can continue on with Michael's presentation. Yeah, I don't know. Um, actually, that's a good question. I don't know the mechanism for actually reporting them, I mean, uh, to the, the public health authority. Um, I don't know the answer to that question, to be honest. Um, I think with respect to the employment issues that we're dealing with today, the question then becomes, um, you know, is there, um, is there grounds to factor that into a decision that you make as the employer with respect to the, um, to the employment relationship ongoing? So in other words, the fact that they've taken time to, um, taken off, time off work to self-isolate and they're not following those practices, that's obviously a legitimate uh, con uh, issue to explore with respect to whether or not they are, um, there's grounds um, to to discipline them or potentially terminate their employment relationship, but that gives rise to a huge, huge, um, significant issues uh, with respect to your potential liability for human rights, or as I said, it is job protective leave. So, you know, it's a factor to potentially consider, but to tread very, very carefully around, I think. With respect to the uh, channels to um, report someone to the public health authority, I'm not sure um, the answer to that, but um, I think uh, it may be, and likely is widely available information you can probably find yourself. So sorry, I couldn't be help, more helpful on that point. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Um, what we're going to do is uh, we're just going to move on to Michael and uh, talking about uh, the other side of the human resources side. So uh, Michael, if you wanted to continue. Uh, thank you very, very much. Appreciate that. And uh, Andrew, some, um, some great information there. Um, and also thank you to, uh, to Haven for putting on this webinar. Um, good afternoon to the audience out there from sunny New Westminster. So definitely some very, very interesting times that we found ourselves in. Um, you know, my portion here is going to be talking a little bit more about how you uh, can actually continue to, to work with your staff members. And uh, we always have a long-term goal of making sure that we can come back to this, whatever the new norm is, in, a, in an equal position. Um, with as many of our employees, valued employees as possible. Um, whereas Andrew's topics of discussion were quite black and white by legal definition, um, the HR world probably nowhere near as close to black and white, um, <clears throat> but I will, I will put up some high level topic um, bullet points and then we can sort of break them down further and hopefully in question and answer and beyond. I thought a number of different ways to kind of start looking at this particular aspect from the human resource side and, I, and I've I think we really should start everything by looking at it from um, your employee and staff perspective and understanding where they're coming from um, and where their drive for information comes from. And, and to be completely honest, it's, it's really about, it's driven by fear. Um, fear for their job, fear for their, uh, for their company that they've um, you know, worked for, uh, fear for the sector that they work within. Uh, and then also concern and fear for those people around them. And that goes everything from, again, within the company and their work environments, be it at work or at home. Um, it goes to their coworkers, it goes to their neighbors, and it goes to those close to them, um, you know, immediate and, and, and distant family. Um, but finally, one thing that under, underlies it all for the employees is there is a really big sense of a loss of control right now. Um, you know, there's so much information and, and just given by what Andrew was able to put forward and what we've all seen over the last uh, four or five days from provincial and federal government, um, it's, it's a very quickly changing landscape and we're all trying as business owners to stay on top of things. Um, but the employees certainly have that complete loss of control. They feel like they're in the washing machine right now. And, and we as business own owners and, and leaders, managers can, can try and help to, to calm that. When I looked at things um, about what I talk about, the most important theme that runs through everything really is communication. And that stems from the clarity of your communication to your team's employees. 
uh, the frequency of your communication out to your companies and to your coworkers, and also the honesty and the way in which you, you're actually communicating the message that you need to. And that message, you know, as much as we love to be consistent, um, again, it changes on a day-to-day -day basis. It changes two or three times a day. Um, you know, as, as I looked at the last two weeks of what we've all had to do of learning how to work in remote spaces and adapt and create processes from our, you know, from our office standpoint, from an employee standpoint, you've got to be comfortable as that, uh, as that leader to, to step up and provide, you know, different messages, albeit meaningful messages at all points in time. Sorry, Michael, <laughs> Michael, don't mean to interrupt, but I think uh, the audience is having a hard time. can't see your slides. Um, so if you wanted to... Um... Mm -hmm. Have we... Can you see what happens, uh, the first the slide, what happens to our staff? No, I don't think they can. No. Okay, let me just, uh, so everybody can just hold on for one second. I'm just Okay, going... one second, one second. What about, uh, what about now? Your people, your future? Yes, I see it. Do you see it? All yeah, right. Yeah, looks good. That great. Okay. Thank you. Technology is also one of the areas we have to adapt to, so appreciate your patience on that side of things. Um, you know, as mentioned, I think you know we, we should we should look at um, you know the, the first thing about what happens to our staff. There there are three positions that again you know when you're communicating back to your team and, and hopefully you can do this is, you know if if your organization is financially strong you are in that 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 good position of being able to keep staff. And you want to make sure that you can communicate that and how you plan to keep the staff you know effectively. If you go beyond that, you are, as, as most of us are, in a financially unsure position right now. And we're unsure because, you know, things like supply chain, we're unsure of the contracts that we've received, we're unsure of, um, you know, the, the, the government requirements come forward. Then, you know, you are facing that potential layoff or temporary layoff, as, as Andrew had mentioned. And again, that's something that, that, that should be communicated clearly as, as a potential to your teams, be it big or small. Um, but there is also that that final one, and this is the the, the the good the good view of things, and that is how could you um, repurpose your individual team members uh, within the organization? Now that requires so much planning from a from a business owner and and uh, business leader standpoint. But again, uh, you know if you're if you're looking at repurposing, you want to look at what other divisions you can repurpose within your organization. Um, you know, and that could be to different projects or projects that do, still do have to go ahead or have not been forced to close, um, you know, due to uh, what the government requirements are. Uh, you could look to repurpose people into different areas of a project or, you know, project coordination, project management, albeit again, from remote working sites. Um, or you could actually repurpose into some form of a contractor arrangement for you and you, need, and you should be looking at... Um, and how that can actually play out as well. Now, remembering that if repurposing is a viable option for you, um, something you really want to do is you want to make sure that you are identifying what that plan looks like. And again, as, as, as leaders in the organization, you know, we're, we're all about making sure that we can put together plans right now that exist for the initial triage, which is the last two weeks and probably the next three weeks to four weeks in the month of April. And the frontline staff that we have, they're the ones that are really, you know, we're asking a lot out of them to go out there and continue to do their jobs and to function, um, you know, efficiently and provide uh, avenues for revenue to come back in. But you also want to make sure that all of your teams out there do understand that we're looking beyond the, the, the short-term triage. We're looking at what happens in the month of May and June the three month plan and the six month plan, because we all want to make sure that when we do come back to it and we will be coming back to, um, you know, a normalization, uh, that we've actually been able to, to convey what those plans have been. If you can get onto your communication plans to your teams and you can do that on, at least on a longer term, on a, on a weekly basis, that's very, very important. But when it comes to the individual um, staff members of, who you're going to actually repurpose, it's very important to talk to them specifically to gain their buy-in. It's one thing to be told, I'm gonna to repurpose you in a specific area, but it's very good and it should have a situation where you can talk to them and say, well, what areas do you feel you can add most value to the company? 
or you know how can you become a person of great value to your particular employer okay um, things that we don't always know we don't always know exactly what skill sets or other skill sets that our employees have and it's a great opportunity right now to find out more a deeper understanding of what that that employee can do for your organization and by doing that you're then getting further um, further opportunities to think about where you could use those individuals um, you could also talk to those individuals and 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 have them see repurposing as a way to round out their skills within their particular organization or within sector as well and Finally, you can actually frame it as it's a value add to that individual if you can repurpose uh, as a way of continued professional development. Every employee wants to continue the development within their chosen sector of work. And taking this opportunity now as a chance for professional development um, keeps them open and keeps them willing and keeps them motivated to want to, to, want to continue working. Um, I think also, what is important is, you know, when you do consult those employees or those groups of employees, you're going a long way towards staff retention. Um, the impact recruitment, we're talking to, you know, hundreds of employees in BC a day and thousands of, um, uh, of affected workers as well. And, you know, so many for the employers, you know, the, the tough choice right now is saying, well, I don't want to necessarily lose my staff. And even if I have to go a temporary layoff, um, you know, how can I make sure that some of those people will come back? That retention is, is, is a huge key and it needs to be paid attention to now. Um, and even from a hiring perspective, it's very difficult to talk about hiring plans now. But when you, have, when you, when you look at what you want to do in two to three months, um, <clears throat> as the owners and managers, you want to think about what you're doing right now to plan for that future hiring, but also by keeping a lot of your employees on board through repurposing. That's also an important I want to talk about um, communication now more specifically, and it's important that you do it with the utmost transparency and the utmost honesty. Um, when you are actually communicating your messages, we've all probably thought we're good communicators to our teams, um, or it's an area that we've wanted to always get better at. In this particular time, again, because there's so many changes on a daily basis, you know, Doubling your communication efforts is probably not enough right now. You want to look at a way you can actually triple your, your frequency of communication back out towards your teams. And it sounds like a lot, but for, for, for all of us that are out there with, you know, in, in this side of things, we want to do everything we possibly can. Uh, we want to make ourselves available, obviously not 24 seven. We have, you know, personal lives to deal with as well and the challenges within that, but you do have to provide some extended hours um, to, to be available. Uh, to your teams and to your employees. So, you know, if you're looking at a, at a, at a number, I would say you, want, you might want to consider that, you know, uh, more than doubling up, but, but go as far as you possibly can. And you're obviously available, uh, you know, through, through weekends, but make sure you also have time for yourself as well. Now, communication also requires mixing up, as I mentioned beforehand, mixing up your topics and the mediums of communication. Um, some examples here is that if you set yourself an agenda where, you're at the least twice a day communicating out to your team about what's happening and what's taking place within um, your organization to continue to ride through the storm. You know, one of your topics needs to be definitely straight business facts, all the facts, everything that you've, that you've had to deal with in that particular day or since the previous evening um, should be communicated out to your team. It's really important not to sugarcoat um, any situations right now. The last thing you want is, an empl is, is, is a workforce that um, is, is, is feeling like everything's good and they all of a sudden get completely blindsided by, by things. That leads to um, a level of unhappiness. Um, even if there is temporary layoffs and they want to come back, they want to know that they're coming back to an organization that was crystal clear with them through every facet of the business making its decisions. As a business owner, as, a, as, as you know, hiring managers, as, as line managers, as leaders, it's okay to say, I don't know. And you can certainly say that with confidence because even this morning reading what, you know, what is available from federal and provincial government, we still don't even have timelines as to when people can apply. Uh, you know, your employees are not really sure when they can apply for their um, subsidies, uh, you know, rent assistance. And as businesses, we certainly don't know exactly what timelines we're working with. We just know that there is a modicum of good 
good news coming and you want to be able to verbalize those thoughts to your uh, to your to your employees and you want to be able to, to to become transparent and share your mental blockages with them um, in in essence what you're doing is you're humanizing yourself and your management teams but you are still showing that you're with them in the short term and you're thinking for that long term for all of your employees as well now if we continue on in terms of uh mix you know various topics things that also matter are the day-to-day -day focus of our employees and even when it comes to to our sector so many of us are involved in, in scheduling and generally things changing on site um, you want to make sure that you can communicate how those schedules might change, what you might have to do, why they're affected. So if, in fact, you are in a situation where you can only have 50 people in a designated area, then how will those work schedules and construction schedules get changed and how will that affect yourselves and which sites can you get to? And that's important information to give back. So that's more of a day-to-day -day communication level. And then you know, a final topic, which we all need to know and do for our teams is um, socializing. So the irony of being distant right now for all of us is we are actually becoming even more and more social. Um, goodness knows if you have a, a web application that provides for, for, for virtual video conferencing, you're probably doing pretty well in this world right now. But um, you wanna to put together some, some different strategies to have your teams get together doing a morning, you know, pre-morning pre coffee break, Friday afternoon beers, whatever that can be, you know, take the time to put that, whether you're in a, a smaller company of, you know, five to 10 employees or 50 plus or, or, or 200 plus, um, you know, get your dedicated teams uh, on board and, and create those opportunities to socialize because everybody does miss uh, working with their coworkers. I think, um, you know, when you, when you further look at um, communicating you always got to think about the fact that the small things do matter now more than ever. Nothing is, nothing is considered, can be considered too small when it comes to your employees hearing information. Um, they would rather hear it from you because they've worked with you. And on top of that, you want to find out different ways of communicating or who's going to communicate the various messages. So, you know, owners, CEOs, presidents, yes, they do a lot of the communication, but definitely if you have, other layers of management within your organization, think about using them. Use your VPs, your directors, use your middle, ma your middle managers, your superintendents, your foremen. Um, and also, I think a lot of us are, are fortunate that we've got some senior trusted employees who may not have ever you know, become uh, designated official management, but those individuals hold a level of trust within all the employees. And if you can get them actually communicating back out to the teams you might have to have a high level um powwow as a management group about what the message or when that communication goes out um definitely make sure that you engage all of those and then to the next point here of you know how and what you share with and definitely make sure you're using all of your um your, your potential mediums out there be it zoom or uh, well, this one's ring central power by zoom be it microsoft teams i know that th those are great um, applications you can use but also make sure that you're doing some sort of a daily email update. And also really as individual managers, we need to make sure that we're talking to each individual member of our team on a daily basis. That is a huge um, requirement in terms of time, but it will go a very, very long way to making sure that those employees remain motivated. They feel like they are part of the solution that you're trying to achieve uh, to have things come back. Um, and then you can even look at other forms of, you know, when we're talking about site-based um, communication methods, yeah, we all, you know, we should be part of our, um, you know, daily toolbox meetings, albeit they are socially distant and, and well-spaced apart, but you want to make sure that you're continuing those and don't ever let those slip at this point in time when communication is so high. Um, I think you know, wrap, wrapping through things here, best practices to come out, and, and it still comes down to what motivation is here and how you can continue it now and going beyond. Um, remember a really important thing that people's daily agendas and planning process and scheduling have changed dramatically in the last two weeks. Um, if you think about it this way, the majority of, 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 of people would spend a certain amount of time on their commute to and from the office or the job site. 
And what typically in this city used to be about a 45 minute drive now becomes about a 45 second commute from one part of your house to your designated working area. And what that does not allow for is most people on their commute do a lot of planning of their day. It allows them to think through what they're gonna do. It gives them clarity. And now it's very, very difficult to condense all of that into that 45 seconds. And as leaders, business owners, managers, uh, we certainly have the ability to help each and every one of our team to become clearer in terms of how they're adapting to working from home. Again, that does require a, you know, a, a lot more work and time from managers, but it is absolutely worth it because you'll start to create the new normal of what that schedule looks like. And as we go back to work, hopefully by you know, May, middle May, um, these things will actually lead to a more efficient working um, team as well. So think, think about how you might want to do that. And then once you've actually established that particular pattern, um, something that I did last week, so we're on about day number seven or eight of working from home, and then I started to tap back into individual members on my team and say, okay, so this is now what we've been doing. I would like you to give me an understanding of what you think about the level of communication. Is it working for you? Is it too much? Do you need less of it? Or do you need more of it? Um, because by doing that, what I've then achieved is I've got my team actually identifying how they want things to, to work. And again, it's all about um, buy-in and, and really importantly, it's about empowering them and going back to that loss of control. It's one of the, the many ways that you can actually hand back control to your employees. Um, we would like to, to think that every one of our employees can be completely self-sufficient when working remotely. Um, that unfortunately is not real but we should be able to do everything we possibly can to make them um, feel like they had that support. Uh, one of the final things here about uh, uncertainty from an employee perspective is, again, going back to navigate how they apply for so many of the different things that might be available to them. Um, these are things we can talk about uh, later, for sure. But, you know, when, when you've got different subsidies that are available, when you've got rent, we don't know. Do as much as you can to actually work through those with them. I'm not saying fill in the forms or help them fill in the forms, but certainly include those in your, uh, you know, every couple of days in, in your updates back towards your teams. Um, that's very, very important. And finally, as I mentioned beforehand, make sure that you are creating social um, socialization and socializing opportunities among your teams. And, um, you know, and then as, as we as businesses, the last slide here is about government assistance. You want to make sure that you are doing everything you can to convey that. And, and while a lot of it is still, you know, you've got to go back to the CRA to find out exactly what it is that's available to you. But as you find that information, even if it's trickling in at slow rates every day, um, please make sure that you do um, share that back to your workforce um, to keep them up to speed. And again, providing clarity and a, and a sense of control. Um, but that's pretty much the end of what I wanted to talk about today. Definitely open and back to you, Wendy, for questions from here. Hi there. Sorry about that. Um, thank you very much, Michael and Andrew. I think this has been a really great informative session. There's a lot to go over. Um, I know there's still lots of questions we haven't answered in the queue and we're running a little over time. So if those of you who uh, have to leave, please, um, please, you know, can leave the webinar at any time. Um, those of you who are uh, wanting to stay on for a few more minutes while we uh, answer some questions, we definitely will do that. So I'm just going to switch off my screen, switch on my screen here, and uh, hopefully you guys can see the screen. Let's see what's happening here. Uh, one sec, guys. Um, okay, so one of the questions was, if I can answer, I think this is a question for uh, one of you here. Under Sorry, under some circumstances, it is difficult for an employee to impart any pre-existing condition. What protects the employee? I can uh, answer that one, I think, uh, Wendy. I think it, what this is probably has to do with uh, the 
workers' compensation topic that I was speaking about earlier, um, which deals with the susceptible worker and whether or not um, what it looks like to uh, consider uh, their uh, pre-existing uh, susceptible condition in determining whether or not it's reasonable for them to think that it's unsafe to attend at work. So um, I think it's a good question. I think the employee's confidential information, which includes their medical information, is protected under the Personal Information Protection Act uh, for, for most uh, organizations in BC. So there is privacy legislation that would protect an employee uh, sharing that from having their employer divulge that information. Beyond that, um, so, so I guess the, the long and the short of it is, is that that information is confidential and it's protected by law once divulged to an employer. But it's really up to the employee uh, to divulge that information to you if they want you to consider that as part of your assessment as to whether or not a refusal to perform work is reasonable given their specific condition. Okay, great. Uh, another question here. How do you ensure your employee has a safe working environment at home? So I think that's related as well to the, the workers' compensation topic. Um, some of the things that I discussed about earlier, uh, I think the most important, which is making sure that you have a, uh, a policy, a work from home policy that deals with things like um, if an employee is working in isolation, for instance, there's a similar requirement uh, to report in as there would be in the ordinary workforce, but as opposed to maybe going through everything, I might just direct the person that answered that question or anybody else that's interested. Workers, WorkSafe BC has actually put out um, a health and safety responsibilities when working from home document online, which actually deals specifically with the COVID-19 issue and, and the social distancing and the work from home requirements. And they actually set out uh, in a little bit more detail what should be in your health and safety policy as an employer. And they look at key health and safety requirements from working uh, from home. So things like reporting workplace injuries, what happens if the employee is working from home and is uh, performing uh, a service or, or, or work for the employer and they end up hurting themselves, how do they report that back to the employer? What are the protocols? Uh, those are the sorts of things. But like I say, if you just probably Google search uh, WorkSafe BC COVID-19 working from home, something to that effect, uh, you'll find uh, a more comprehensive document that uh, WorkSafe BC has put out. Thanks, Andrew. And to those of you who are listening, we'll take a look uh, for that document or that link, and then we'll share it with everybody. Um, maybe uh, one more question here, and then unfortunately, I wish we could answer them all, but um, I just worry about uh, timing out here. So um, how do you, okay, no, sorry, that was a question already asked. Um, subcontractors, what protection for them? Um, is, is that a question to me or I'm not? I'm not sure. It's not quite, it wasn't quite, uh, that's kind of verbatim here. So um, what I might do is um, uh, if that person had a specific question, maybe to direct it to either yourself, Andrew, or to Michael, and then as a follow-up. And there's one question here as well. The 75% subsidy requires proof of 30% loss in business. How do you account for the cyclical nature of this industry? Are there mechanisms to account for the compensation of yearly business or change in expected income? I think um, it's, it's a very difficult one because we do know that um, the construction work is quite seasonal. I think that, unfortunately, that is going to be something that, that gets downloaded a little bit further from the federal government uh, and the government in general next week or during the course of this week. It may require some, some detailed documentation of, um, of um, uh, past revenues, um, but really it's difficult to answer that right now. I think that's a stay tuned. And last one here. Some people are paid hourly. How can an employee approve work hours? And sorry, say, yeah, sorry, say that again. Sorry, um, it doesn't say who is directed to, but it says uh, one person asked, uh, some people are paid hourly. How can an employee approve work hours? I guess for that they're losing 30% loss of maybe their wages or whatever. Um, how do they approve their work hours if they're paid hourly? 
I don't know uh, with respect to the subsidy issue, I, maybe Michael, you could comment on that, but I'm just wondering if maybe this is a question about employees that are working from home, how do they prove what they've been doing on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis, in which case I guess you could have them do timesheets or, or weekly updates or that sort of a thing. I'm not sure if that's what is being referred to. Yeah, that's, ex that's exactly where I would have come from. You know, we, we are fortunate. There are many um, automated, automated um, time trackers out there. Uh, but again, it, it, it would be a different situation for each particular person's working scenario. Uh, definitely happy to, to answer that question um, offline after this meeting. Okay, um, I know there's some follow-up uh, comment to that, but I think what we'll do is just in, in uh, respect of the webinar time here, we're at one o'clock and uh, we are recording this session so we can post it online. If um, if the attendees, I sent in the chat, but I will follow up with you, the emails for Andrew and Michael to continue the question and follow up, you're welcome to do that. Um, Michael and then Andrew, if there's some like common questions that come up that you're seeing, if you don't mind sharing um, some of the responses to that, that would be wonderful. I could just add that on to um, the content share and then we can just make sure that people get looped in who weren't able to hear the question or get the answer to the question as it was posted during the chat or the Q&A would be great. Absolutely will. Wonderful. Happy to do well, that. Thank you. Wonderful. So thank you everybody so much. It was our first uh, webinar. So hopefully it was pretty smooth, um, but we couldn't have done it with our experts today, Andrew and Michael. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, a quick uh, promo that we are looking to do another session uh, related to the COVID-19 response uh, with a builders panel next week. Tuesday. So we'll send to members uh, more information once that comes available. Um, but as I said, the material here covered today will be posted. I will share that with uh, all our members as well as through social. So if you know people who could use this information, please share it. We're happy to do that. And again, thank you, Andrew and Michael. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.